took me about 10 years for the writing of it, but it was really about 20 years that um, it took me to learn what I needed to know in order to write the book. So um, some of you are familiar with my first book that was a memoir um, called Spirit Car. And so I grew up um, in a suburb of Minneapolis and uh, my dad was Swedish and my mother was Lakota. And I knew when I was growing up that I had four siblings also, one of whom is here. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, and I knew uh, when I was growing up that my mother uh, had spent six years at the Holy Rosary Mission School on the, on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and that her four older sisters spent uh, many years at the St. Francis Mission School on the Rosebud Reservation. But nobody knew or understood why there were boarding schools. At that time, nothing, nothing was being taught about boarding schools in school, nothing about the 1862 Dakota War, very little about um, the Dakota perspective on history at all. So um, we grew up not being connected to our community and um, not really learning much about our family history because my mother really didn't like to talk about her childhood. She used to say, we were poor and I'm done with all that. But you know how, you know how we are. Um, just, tell, just tell us that you don't want to talk about it. And, <laughs> and that, that so, uh, sooner or later you have a writer in the making. <laughs> so as I, when I became an adult, um, I really started to think about those questions that were raised in my family by the fact that I was growing up in, in a relatively sheltered life in um, Minneapolis and yet my mother had grown up in a boarding school. And so it was that, um, that contrast and that question about my own cultural identity then that really prompted me to start the research on the memoir. And, to, um, and so eventually I published the memoir about five generations in my mother's family as a way of showing how assimilation has worked across generations. And so that book, um, Spirit Car, was published in 2006. But while I was working on that, um, I heard about these very old, rare indigenous seeds that were being grown out in a tiny little bare bones garden uh, south of the Twin Cities um, in Farmington. And because I'm a gardener, I heard about those seeds and I knew immediately that I needed to go and work with them. It, it, you know, when I look back, it was almost like being called to the work. And in hindsight, the fact that the work that, uh, well, that, that relationship that I made with seeds at that time, what I didn't know was that it would, it would literally change the course of my life. Um, and I also didn't know then the long history of those seeds. I didn't know how close they'd come to extinction or how critically important they were to the culture, to um, native communities. But at that time, I was a gardener. I just wanted to work with, with the old seeds. And I was fascinated by the stories they carried. So if you think of a seed as a record of every season, you know, they, they hold that, that genetic record of how much rain fell, how hard the wind blew. And they're also carrying those stories of the people who cared for them. So um, there was Cherokee Trail of Tears corn, for example, that families had carried on that initial removal. There was um, traditional tobacco that was supposed to be hundreds of years old. And then there were black turtle beans that were a gift from um, a Hopi medicine man. So, so for me, it, it was the ultimate experience. The gardener and writer find seeds, you know, seeds <laughs> carry stories. <laughs> so, um, I, so that, became, that began what has been a long 20-year uh, um, relationship and just love affair with, in, with seeds in general. Um, so as a volunteer, I just I kept um, working with with um, this little program, which was called Dream of Wild Health. And um, in 2008, then they invited me to come in as their executive director. And by then, it was a 10-acre farm 
up in Hugo, which, as we all know, is just up the road, whichever way the road is, you know, I, yeah, <laughs> that way. Um, but um, I like to think of coming to Dream a Wild Health as where my real education began, both as a, a gardener and a seed keeper and also as a, a Dakota woman, that um, instead of the education and what I had learned about our relationship with the earth growing up, um, I learned from elders and seed keepers and farmers and native youth about a very different way of being in relationship with the earth. And um, there's a saying in Dakota, metakuye owasi, which means we are all related. And if you extend that thinking not only to the human beings in this room, but also to all of the beings around us, outside of us, so the plants, the animals, the air, the water, and the soil, and if you think that in that relationship, we are responsible for taking care of each other. So this was the beginning of really shifting my understanding of the world to a relationship in which I have a responsibility, not only to care for those seeds, but for those plants um, and for the soil. And, and we call this relationship, it's really based in reciprocity. And this is a key concept in Dakota thinking that if, you, if we accept these gifts from the soil, the, the, which is our food, um, we also have a responsibility to give back. And you know, all the ways that we give back, um, compost, water, letting soil rest, uh, planting cover crops. So as gardeners, we know how to be in that relationship um, with the garden and with our seeds. So um, the, some of the other teachings that I learned from Ernie Whiteman, who was, uh, who was our spiritual leader and elder, was to think of the seeds as our ancestors, as our relatives, and as sacred beings. He also taught us that food is medicine, so that if you start with really these really um, these original seeds, so indigenous are the same as heirloom. So an heirloom seed that hasn't been genetically modified, you start with these really strong seeds, you plant them, you grow them with love, and then you share them um, with your community, then this is a way of, of transforming your food from something that comes wrapped up in a package in a grocery store or <clears throat> in a sack from a fast food restaurant, and it becomes medicine. And that medicine is capable of really restoring our physical, spiritual, and emotional health. So this is the healing work that I was doing at Dream of Wild Health for um, over the course of 11 years. And at the same time, working with Native youth and watching them come up from the cities, many of them from very difficult backgrounds. And <clears throat> when they got to the farm, you know, they were so shy and so self-conscious that they would hardly speak, they wouldn't make eye contact. But over the course of the summer, as they learned to garden and to cook and to be in a circle with um, stable adults, then we saw these children transform. We saw them become leaders in their communities. And so all of that, for me, was a way of learning about the transformative power of gardening and being in relationship um, with the plants and animals who who so willingly or maybe not willingly but who so graciously offer themselves as food so that we can survive and so there is a story a very very old story about seeds that says there's an original agreement that was formed thousands of years ago and, <clears throat> and in that agreement seeds Seeds agreed to give up their wildness in exchange, um, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> dry air. So seeds agreed to give up their wildness in exchange for the care that they receive from human beings. So that's the original agreement, and that's the kind, that's the kind of relationship that we put in place at Dream of Wild Health. <coughs> 
So as a writer, uh, you know, you, I was absorbing all of this and learning from it. <clears throat> and at the time, I was while I was at Dream of Wild Health, that's when I started working on the Seed Keeper. So the memoir had come out in <clears throat> 2006. And then when I was, um, I was away at a writer's residency in 2009, and I was um, working on another book, but what I was talking about was the seeds that I was working with. So I was telling these other women writers all about the seeds and these amazing elders I was meeting, and they're called seed keepers. And this woman writer um, turns to me and she says, well, there's the title for your novel, you know, <laughs> I never thought about a novel, but um, you know, I just carried that thought until it was time for me to really start working on that book. And so, like I said, it's been it's been the past it's been the past ten years. So, um, you know, in addition to doing the other work, it just I'm a slow writer. I have to think about things a lot. Um, and one of the things that um, I learned in the process of writing that book was the, the many stories that needed to be told around these seeds. So um, at the heart of the book is a story, is a true story. And if you've, if you've read the book, um, you know that there is a, a chapter for Marie Blackbird uh, in, in 1862 where she and her mother are um, it's, it's during the 1862 Dakota War. Um, Marie's father is away at the, at the fighting. They don't know if he's gonna make it back. And she and her mother are, um, are they don't know what's gonna happen. And so they sow, they sow the seeds that they, have, that they have protected for many generations in their family into the hems of their skirts and they hide them in their pockets. And then the next day, the soldiers round them up, um, as they did in real history. They rounded up the Dakota women and children and elders uh, after the 1862 Dakota War, um, force marched them to a concentration camp at Fort Snelling, and then forcibly removed them from the state. But it was that story that about the, the women sowing the seeds in the hems of their skirts and in their pockets that stayed with me. Because I thought about, um, this is a story I had learned on the Dakota Commemorative March to honor these, these women, children, and elders. And I thought about the courage and the strength that they showed in that moment when they didn't know where they were gonna be sent they didn't know how they were going to feed their families, but they had the they had the presence of mind to protect those seeds. And then even during that march, when families were hungry, they protected those seeds for a coming generation, for a coming season, and for future generations. And so um, they're the reason why we have that corn today. And I actually grow that corn in my own garden. I don't have um, a lot of space, but I can grow enough corn as a reminder to me always of the importance of that story and the actions of those women in protecting what they love and of thinking um, of those future generations. And so that is really the story that, that formed the heart of the book. Um, and then the, so the main character is Ros Rosalie Ironwing. And she, for me, she really represents what assimilation has done to Native families over generations. So from boarding schools to removals to um, uh, loss of land um, to reservation systems, Rosalie's family has reached that point in her life where she no longer believes she has a family, she has no connection to her community, she's, um, she does not speak her, her language, and she at that point has no connection at all to seeds. And so she became the main character. <clears throat> and in the beginning I thought, well I, I'll, I'll write the book from Rosalie's point of view in first person, and this will be Rosalie's story. 
But then, while I was working on the book, I did a writing exercise to try to um, get more insight into some of the other characters. And what I discovered was that I had four voices that really wanted to be included in, the, in telling this story. And what that allowed me to do was to um, bring in different perspectives and different experiences across a much broader time span so that Marie Blackbird, for example, who was Rosalie's great-great-grandmother, could show that experience of Dakota women during the 1862 war and that story of, of um, hiding the seeds in their skirts. I could tell that story from a first-person um, point of view. And then I could also show, so Marie becomes the character who really carries some of the, um, the hard history um, of the of the book, so the it's that Dakota um, 1862 Dakota War experience, the removal, um, and then also the the boarding schools. Um, <clears throat> their family has a has a, a, a difficult experience with boarding schools as well. But um, the story, <clears throat> the book itself begins as Rosalie Ironwing is about to leave the farm where she's lived for 22 years and return home to her childhood home on a Dakota reservation. So after her father died when she was 12, she grew up in a foster family in Mankato. And she, really, and she believed at that time that, and she had been told she had no family. She, and she had no gardening skills, no connection to seeds. And, and it wasn't until she marries a white farmer and learns to garden that she begins this journey um, that will ultimately take her, uh, return her to her community, to her family, and to their legacy of seeds. So Rosalie is, she's central to the story. But um, I want to read a first excerpt, which is um, told by Rosalie. And is, um, she's talking about her best friend, Gabby Makespeace. And Gabby was a really fun character to write. She's, um, she's definitely a composite. But I use the name Gabby um, inspired by several Gabbies that I know who are just Fierce. They're just outspoken activists, strong women, and they've done amazing work out in the world um, on behalf of the environment. And so Gabby is very much inspired by those women, and she, um, she, she's a survivor, and she goes on to become a lawyer and an activist for the rivers, but at this point, um, she's definitely more of a, <clears throat> a, a rebel. So this is set in 1976, and Rosalie and Gabby are um, in high school. Before I met Gabby, I never had a close friend. I don't think either of us knew what it meant to have a best girlfriend, someone who could be trusted with your secrets, who would always help you out, whether that meant rewriting Gabby's homework or escaping Shirley's house. We were meant to be together, a couple of coyote pups who learned to hunt as a pack in order to survive. We had dreams, too, about moving to the Twin Cities together or spending a year traveling to powwows all over the country. Gabby knew how to contest dance, even winning a few before she moved to Mankato. But then she'd bring up Earl, and our daydreams would go up in smoke. For someone like me, who'd never known a real family after my father passed, it was, as, it was as if I'd gained a sister, a brother, or even an auntie who always made me feel welcome at her house. In those early months of getting to know her, Gabby was like a sip of water on a hot summer day, perfectly sweet and cold, quenching a thirst I didn't even know I had. A few weeks into my sophomore year, we were sitting outside during lunch break to avoid the cafeteria crowd. I tore my jelly sandwich into small pieces that I tossed to a gang of sparrows who had become nearly tame, a few even pecking crumbs from my hand. 
The day was fall chilly, with ragged clouds moving fast across the sky, and the kind of wind that brings rain later. Gabby picked at her nail polish, brushing flecks of jungle pink from her bell-bottom jeans. She crossed her legs at the ankle, showing off the high-heeled boots that had been a gift from Earl. I wondered what her Auntie Vera thought of those boots. I'm bored, Gabby said, followed by one of her big, dramatic sighs. I brushed the last few crumbs from my hand and watched the sparrows scatter toward the nearby elm trees, startling a crow into flight. <clears throat> In the four months that we had been hanging out, I'd learned that boredom was a death sentence for whatever Gabby and I were doing. She didn't like to read or study or do anything that required her attention and focus for more than a few minutes. I noticed that in the history class we shared this year, she doodled in her notebook, twirled a strand of hair around her finger as she stared out the window. The teacher, Miss Hagland, assumed she wasn't paying attention and Gabby's grades, grades seemed to prove her right. But one day, Miss Hagland made the mistake of asking her which lands in Minnesota were include, included in the 1851 Traverse des Sioux Treaty, thinking she had caught Gabby unprepared. Gabby turned slowly from the window and stared at Miss Hagland before answering, my land, and you're standing on it. That was the Gabby I liked best, the one she hid behind a cloud of pot smoke and hairspray. To be honest, I was afraid that Gabby would get bored with me, or that she'd start listening to the whispered jokes that floated behind us as we walked down the hall. Pocahontas and Sasquatch, Haas and Little Joe, word arrows flung in a gauntlet of teenage scorn. She sailed through it all, head high, occasionally flipping her middle finger. The other students seemed to sense that she was ready for a fight, any time, any place. Me, they'd never notice, at least before Gabby chose me as her friend. So that tells you a little bit about Rosalie and Gabby, two of the, two of the main characters. Um, throughout the book, the story moves around in time, and it moves around between the different narrators. So two of the other narrators are uh, Darlene Kilsdeer, who is uh, Rosie's great aunt, who spends much of her, her life actually looking for Rosalie when Rosalie is, is um, placed in foster care without, um, without any attempt to notify any of her own family. And this, this was, this was, a, this was a, a, a huge issue for Native families especially in the mid-century. Um, mid um, and in some cases, it was called the, the scoop um, because so many children were removed from their homes by social services, and they didn't have any obligation at all to uh, work within the tribe or with uh, other relatives. So in 1978, I think it was, ICWA was passed, the Indian Child Welfare Act, and that, um, that mandated that uh, social services actually had to work with reservation communities and tribes and families um, to look for a placement within their own family. But um, so part of what part of what Rosalie and Darlene's experience is is about that that Rosalie grew up in foster care, and <clears throat> and her um, great aunt Darlene Kilsdeer spent much of her life looking for her. Um, and so, uh, and then Marie Blackbird is Rosalie's great-great-grandmother, and she's the character that, that was uh, 14 in, uh, during the 1862 Dakota War. So I would like to read one more excerpt, and in this one, Rosalie is meeting her great-aunt Darlene Kilsdeer for the first time, after believing for many years that she had no family. And Rosalie has a she has a son named Thomas who has, they have a difficult experience um, because he was, you know, in a, in a mixed family. He was raised not only by his um, 
So by his Dakota mother, but also by his father, who was trying to teach him conventional farming. So that that mix of cultures can, can sometimes lead to confusion for children who are being pulled in two directions. So in this excerpt, Rosalie Ironwing and her son, Thomas, have just arrived to visit her great aunt, Darlene Killsdeer, uh, for the first time uh, meeting a family member since her father died when she was 12. This is set in 2002. <clears throat> Darlene Kilsdeer had just finished lunch when her nurse invited us into the apartment. Darlene's voice had sounded so frail on the phone that I was not sure what to expect. My throat was tight and my eyes burned with fatigue. I felt oddly numb. I couldn't wait to get this over with. Already I regretted bringing Thomas with me. As I waited for the nurse to hang up our coats, I looked around at the faded carpet, the scuff marks on dingy white walls. Darlene's third floor window looked out at an elementary school. The apartment was less than 10 miles from where I had once lived on the other side of town. The living room was small with a television in one corner and two mismatched chairs for guests. A few steps into the room, I stopped abruptly stunned by the sight of tall corn stalks growing in buckets and cans set on yellowed newspapers, their edges curled and stained with mud. The floor was littered with brown leaves. From the curtain rod hung a dozen ears of blue and rose speckled corn, neatly braided. On the ledge outside the window, I could see bits of bread and apple. I began to wonder if Darlene might be senile as the nurse quietly stacked a tray with dishes, she nodded toward the two chairs. I moved a pile of folded laundry to the floor and sat down, Thomas next to me. Darlene was leaning back in a recliner with her eyes closed. An oxygen tank stood on the floor near her chair. A thin cloud of dark hair, streaked heavily with gray, fell around her shoulders, framing her thin face her skin a translucent yellow. I knew her high cheekbones, the sharp ridge of her nose. Bony hands rested on the blanket that covered her lap, the two thin mounds of her legs. I set the damp package of nettles that I had gathered that morning on the table near Darlene's chair. As we waited for Darlene to open her eyes, we listened to the low murmur from the television as Bob Barker announced a new winner on The Price is Right. Thomas straightened the collar of his shirt and sat jiggling one foot, unable to keep still. A plaque on the shelf above the television named Darlene Killsdeer as Miss Indian Princess for 1939. A birch bark basket held a long braid of sweet grass. Inside a dusty frame, was a photo of a child standing next to a much younger Darlene. They were posing in front of the cabin. The child was me. When I turned back, Darlene was awake. We studied each other. It is you, she said. You have your mother's eyes. When I introduced Thomas, he stood and extended his hand to her. She looked up at him and frowned. Turning to me, she said, Rosalie, why is your son in such a hurry? An awkward silence fell in the room. Then I felt a soft touch on my arm. Darlene leaned forward and patted my hand. You did the best you could, she said. You had no mother to learn from. Your father passed too soon. And they took you before any of us knew what had happened. That's how it was back then. They could just come and take your children. That's why... That's why Darlene start, began to cough, raising a white handkerchief to her lips. The nurse came in with a glass of water and a pill. We waited while Darlene took her medicine. That's why I had to plant this corn, she continued with a weak smile. That's how I found you. Plants have their own way of talking. It's not the same here as in the garden, but it was something I could do. I could ask the plants for their help. I could ask the crow for his help. 
I could talk to the oak trees on the boulevard outside my apartment and ask them to watch for you. You must have been 12 when they took you. I pounded on desks and filled out paperwork and walked and walked, just hoping I would catch sight of you somewhere. Every time I walked past a school, I would stop and look at all the little girls running on the playground. Every time I climbed on a bus, I looked in the face of each child. I dreamed you at night, living somewhere behind a metal fence, your face always turned toward the door. Year after year, we've kept this vigil. I promise to wait for you until my last breath. And now you're here. And so, so part of that, wanting to tell that story is to bring forward a couple of themes. One is don't give up. So even when times are extremely hard, you keep, you keep hope alive. And part of that for Darlene in growing that corn in buckets in her apartment was she was, in, she was caring for seeds and she couldn't give up. So she had to do whatever she could with what she had at an age when she just wasn't old enough to do a garden. She's living in an apartment for seniors. So what she could do was plant seeds in buckets and keep them going. And so there's that, there's that lesson in the book that you know, no matter what, there's something we can do. When we're, we're faced with these just overwhelming um, headlines about climate change, there's something we can do. Whether or not you're gonna grow corn in a bucket, you know, maybe there's something else, but you can grow a, you can grow a tomato on your balcony you can, um, you, can, you can choose the seeds that you want to plant. You can, you can support your local farmer at the farmer's market. There are, um, you know, part of what I wanted to do in writing this book was to, was to keep that hope alive. That I, I see, I talk to people who just sound so filled with despair that the state of, of, our, of the earth is, is almost overwhelming, and it is. But at the same time, it's exquisitely beautiful. And that, you know, I come out from listening to an hour of CNN news about what's happening at the, the climate conference, and there's a, there's a flight of geese flying overhead. And if they're low enough, I can hear their wings. And, you know, everything is, is um, in that, in that um, plant and animal world, they're, they are adapting and surviving and doing the best they can with what they have. And so even though there are hard places in this book, I did ultimately want it to be a story that was hopeful, that, that um, just by looking at the example of what, what um, this family, these women had done across generations, that we realized the responsibility that we do carry and that we find ways uh, to do this work. Um, so I would like to close tonight with the video, a four minute video poem, and it's titled, The Seeds Speak. And that reminds us of our original agreement with seeds, where the seeds gave up their wildness in exchange for human beings agreeing to take care of them. And as you watch, I want to encourage you to reflect on your own relationship with seeds, plants, and the earth. To quote Dakota scholar and activist Harley Eagle, who said, how do we fall back in love with the earth and with our seeds? So one moment while Okay, are we able to turn the lights down too? Right All right. We are hungry, but the sleep is upon us. We are thirsty, but the mother has instructed us not to wait too early. We are restless, chafing against this thin membrane, pushing back against the dark that bids us to lie still, 
suspended in a near death that is not dying. We hold time in this space, we hold a thread to infinity that reaches to the stars. The mother gave us patience stronger than our hunger, stronger than our thirst. We dwell in the realm of dreams and spirit. When the sun draws near, we awake and embrace the warmth, fed by the soil and nourished by the rain. When the cold returns, we withdraw once more to rest and to dream. We remember when all of the world had its own song. To know the song was to speak to all beings in their own language. The land told stories of far away places, of mountains and cliffs and verdant valleys. The mighty river sang its slow course along the ridges once carved by a glacier. Long ago, when the frost was still dug deep into the earth, the humans came. They sang us awake and offered gifts of prayer. They came as hungry relatives with a pitiful need to see their children survive. An agreement was made. We surrendered our wildness to live in partnership with the humans. Because we cared for each other, the people and the seeds survived. For many generations, this agreement was kept. Our hunger was fed. Our thirst was quenched. Our restlessness was fulfilled each time we breached the Earth's crust to reach toward the sun, toward the stars. Then came a long silence, a drought of memory, a time of endless darkness. They came no more, calling us with song and prayer. Still we waited, just as the mother had instructed. The earth kept spinning through her seasons, but the human did not return. Now, our time is almost gone. The pulse of life flickers, dims as the heartbeat slows. We cannot wait much longer. evening your job remember come up with questions I've been waiting for this conversation <laughs> yes Erica I have a comment and then a question yeah first of all I became very attached to Rosalie so the question is could you make a sequel please oh <laughs> yes um, I could yeah I, I there's actually the the two young men in the uh, thank you for adjusting the two young men, um, I'm really interested in knowing what comes next for them as well. So yeah, thank you for that question. Can you repeat the questions? I will, yes. So she asked about a sequel, um, especially being interested in Rosalie, the character. So yeah, I'm, I'm mulling what, what comes next now. Yes? No, it's film we just saw, there was a Wilson yeah. playing guitar and family members? Yeah, so the, um, the comment was, in the film, we, there's a Wilson playing the uh, guitar, and that is actually my brother, um, Dave Wilson, who, who, um, who 
well, who, who wrote that music and had it put it, what's that, produced it um, as part of the Dakota Commemorative March. And then we, you know, I love that. I love that music. So we used it for this video. Yeah. Uh, can you take any personal credit for the uh, USDA's recent announcement of the formation of two seed processing centers in conjunction with the American Food Alliance? Oh, interesting. No, I can't take any credit for that. <clears throat> Um, I'm really happy to hear about it though. I just, so I retired about two months ago, so I'm not as in the loop as I used to be, but um, that's good news. I'm glad to hear it. Oh, I'm sorry, um, the USDA has, has created two new seed processing projects um, in collaboration with the Native Food Alliance? So, uh, do you mean NAPSA? Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, um, and is that the one in Akwesasne? And um, this would have been recent. Oh, I know what you mean. So, this was happening. So, so, I was the executive director for the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance up until two months ago. And so one of the projects that was um, being completed shortly before I left was a grant from the, U, uh, the USDA to fund um, seed work. So the, the um, NAFSA, which is the acronym, actually does seed work as well as other food sovereignty work across the country. So this is, a, that's a new partnership with the USDA, which is, you know, which is great. Yeah? The 10 acres you're talking about up in Juba, is that a farm where they are growing food to sell? So the question is about the 10 acre farm up in Hugo, <coughs> which is Dream of Wild Health and has now grown into a 30 acre farm. Um, and continues to grow, and they actually do, um, they do a CSA and they do a farmer's market through the summer. That uh, the farmer's market is in the cities at the Four Sisters Market on Franklin Avenue, and then the CSA they make um, available through their online website. So the, those foods are available for um, for anybody, yeah, for the market. And it's, you know, it's wonderful to support work like that because you're also supporting native youth too to come out. Um, the, the youth programs bring native youth from between eight and 18 up to the farm um, for a day program that is completely free to the youth. So they get picked up, they, the older kids get paid to do the work and um, that it's just an incredible program. So yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah. I'm curious about your own upbringing. You had a Dakota mother uh -huh. and a Swedish father. Did one culture have predominance over the other, or was it? Well, so the question is about my upbringing um, with a Lakota mother and I should say a, a Swedish descent father, so, you know, the heritage. Um, and growing up in the 1950s, that was, a, you know, a pretty conventional upbringing where um, my dad worked full time, my mom was home um, with the five of us, and so, so it, it's kind of hard to characterize, you know, the, the, that power balance that there is in marriages, whereas, you know, my dad was the, the breadwinner. So he was that, you know, that male uh, support role. But it w I think it was true in our house, as probably in a lot of households, that my mother really was the one who, because um, she was home with us all day. So she was the one really running the home, which is, 
you know, so I, you know, I would say their roles were very different, but they, they both shared a, a very different kind of um, relationship with us. Yeah, both strong personalities. Yeah. So did she ever sit down and actually talk about her heritage and her background, or did you have to use other means to research that? So she, um, the question is, did, did my mother ever um, actually sit down and talk about her background? Um, she did share one story with my siblings and I when we were growing up about um, being left at boarding school for two years when her family unexpectedly moved from Rapid City to Minneapolis looking for work. So she did tell us that story, and it, that was part of what really drew me into um, wanting to understand um, how that was, how my grandparents had um, made that decision, and then also just to understand our cultural identity. So, you know, I think it was more that she didn't, she wasn't really um, a storyteller, so much, but when I started working on the book, I'd go out and travel around and talk to people, and then I'd write, I'd write a chapter, and I'd bring it back and I'd, I'd show it to her, and she would read it, and then she would tell me what she thought. You know, I, I caught it, I didn't get it. So um, the first chapter I wrote in that in that um, memoir was about her being left at boarding school, and then I showed her that story. And she said, and all she said was, well, that feels right. And that, you know, and then that for me was a green light to keep going on the project. So she read everything. She told me, like, if I didn't quite capture somebody's personality. Um, and, and then, um, so she had, she had read the, the book um, shortly before she passed. And, and so there wasn't that storytelling in the way of, telling me what I needed to know to write, but she was definitely a collaborator on it. Did and, you know and, your grandparents? Pardon me? Did you know your grandparents? Yeah, um, I did know my grandparents, but they, they, um, they passed when, I think I was like 10 or 11, so before I was old enough to, but you know, I have memories. I have memories of them, so that's helpful. Yes, Susan Wilson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my sister pointed out that we did. Uh, there were other. Um, I mean, my my mother was one of nine, so her closest sister, another aunt, was also a really helpful collaborator and she also read the manuscript before it was published so I had help from siblings, cousins, aunts, um, and then a lot of um, distant relatives on writing that book. And, and I have to say her, uh, she, her she, she definitely was an influence in the Rosalie character that you know that way of um, there is a there is a passive part of Rosalie in the beginning when she's figuring out what her life is, and I in a, in a way I thought you know it somewhat reminds me of my mother who was a very strong person, um, but uh, she also was alive at a time when she didn't have a lot of choices. So she, as the saying in our family goes, she made the best of it, whatever it was, and she was an incredible um, mother and grandmother and aunt. So she's part of the book too. Did she speak the Dakota language? Um, the question is, did my mother speak the Dakota language? Um, she did not, um, but she surprised me one day when the two guys came from Goodwill to pick up uh, something that we were donating and they were clearly Native men. <clears throat> she came out to the garage. She said, "Hokoda," <laughs> which means "Hello, friend." And I was standing there. I thought, "What? <laughs> Who is this?" 
So, you know, she had, she had um, a few phrases like that. Yeah. I, I was struck by the theme of lamb loss, and, um, and I wondered if you might give us an insight. It feels like um, Thomas, uh, Rosalie's son, and the farmers are struggling with loss of control of their own land because of the genetically modified seeds and the migration of those um, patented seeds. So I just wanted to, what your reflections might be about how that narrative is switching and in some ways um, the Euro-American experience of agriculture too looks like it's posed on the edge of land loss. Yeah. Um, I, would you mind if I sit? I'm just going to grab go. a chair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. when the genetically modified seeds and um, more industrialized agriculture started moving in and and there was a so there was a parallel loss there between what happened with native communities who lost so much of their homelands in um, through the treaty system and then the the farmers themselves and, and this was you know this was something that I really thought hard about that because I didn't want to portray farmers as the villains. Um, you know, it's a really complicated history what has happened um, for reservations and land allotment. But I wanted to show how farmers too have had to really struggle to make hard decisions once um, after World War II when, when farming essentially was um, taken over in many ways by chemical com uh, companies who then began uh, creating chemicals that were used as fertilizers and pesticides in uh, large quantities and then um, genetically modified seeds was another uh, technology that really transformed farming from what had been um, family a family based operation years ago and the way that um, farmers knew to take care of their land I mean you had this whole idea of balance with animals who provided uh, manure for the fields and then you know the you rotated crops and so that system was, was really under attack uh, once we moved into genetically modified seeds and the changes that that brought to farming so i wanted to show that full spectrum of evolution from the from the the time of the the uh, women who saved their seeds during the 1862 war to the time that farmers are facing these decisions uh, around survival that you know sometimes it meant hanging on to your farm or not whether or not uh, you made that switch to the technology of new seeds so it's a really hard complicated issue um, and and hopefully the book raises that as a question this is where we've come this is, these are some of the forces that were at work. And then, um, and then we have to ask ourselves as a, as a society, is this where we wanna keep going? Do we want a food system that is so based in technology and requires um, such uh, harmful inputs of, per, of chemicals into our soil and to look at the consequences? So it's, it's more about raising questions. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. It's farming, that evolution in farming is a big, that's a big thing. Yeah. I had to chuckle on your first gardening attempt in the book, or Rosalie's first gardening attempt, to stir all the seeds together and 
scatter them the way the wind does. I thought, well, that's going to be a fun harvest. <laughs> but, but I also have to say that I felt bad for the garden when Rosalie left to, to go live in her native community. Yeah. Um, and you described it so well that it's going to be covered over with weeds and, and nobody's going to care for it. And I just, I felt yeah. abandoned myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the comment was just about, um, <clears throat> about the garden and that being left behind and Rosalie's first attempt at gardening when she, you know, she's never, she's never been around gardening in her life. So what she does is mix her seeds up and scatter them as they would in a, in a forest, which is where she learned about plants. And so, yeah, I, I had fun writing about that, just imagining what, what kind of garden would emerge from <clears throat> that early attempt. And, you know, and it's that, um, also her attachment to those seeds and do they stay? Do they stay at the farm where they originated? I mean, she didn't take them with her, so um, yeah, that, but that was another, to go back to that farming question too, the fact that Rosalie learns about seeds from John's mother's collection. That's, so you see that overlap. It's not just indigenous seeds and native communities who are doing this work. This is work that was also being done, um, you know, on anyone who was really taking care of their gardens. Everyone used to save their seeds. You know, 150 years ago, we didn't have a seed industry. Seeds were not, um, seeds were not, used, seeds were not for sale. Seeds were not uh, patented the way they are. I'm sorry, seeds were for sale, but they weren't patented the way they have become these days. So the fact that in 150 years we went from no seed industry to having companies like Bayer and you know that bought Monsanto taking over and patenting patenting life, um, which feels insane to me, and then and then taking that work and 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 imposing it on the rest of the world, especially in developing countries, essentially. Uh, taking advantage of, com of countries that, uh, that then surrender their traditional seeds for a system that can't work long term. So, uh, yeah. I don't know if you answered this question if I missed it, but are there still indigenous seeds? I mean, are they? Oh, all yeah, so the question done? is. Are there still indigenous seeds? And yes, there are, and they're making a comeback. So um, indigenous seeds, when I say that, I mean heirloom seeds that belong to native families or tribal communities you know, for many generations. And so the, there was a Potawatomi woman, Cora Baker, who saved seeds all her life on her own farm, and she gave her collection to Dream of Wild Health. And so they're growing out those seeds. NAFSA, the other organization, is also supporting communities in growing out their seeds. And they, the, the, the hope is that these seeds then um, become a, a food source again for their communities. Because these are the traditional foods that, that many communities relied on. So, the, the work is underway, but there's been a lot of knowledge that has been lost around gardening and seed saving. And so part of the work is helping to educate communities about the importance of the seeds and then helping them learn the skills that they need to grow them and cook with them, because these are different flavors. Traditional corn tastes very different from the sweet corn that we get today, because sweet corn, you know, they've hybridized it so much for the flavor that it's kind of like eating a donut. <laughs> so it tastes good, really, you know, but but just imagine that as you're, it, it's more of a, a very simple carb now, whereas traditional um, native corn is high, actually has a fairly high level of protein. So, um, 
different foods. So there's just a lot of education where the seeds are, are slowly returning though in greater quantities. You can find some, um, and you can find a lot of good heirloom seeds through seed savers in Iowa. They also have some native varieties too, some indigenous seeds that are in wide enough um, quantities that they can be publicly distributed. Yeah. Is there anything that we wouldn't recognize? Are there any seeds that, that oh, would be unknown to us? Um, or vegetables that would be? Strange vegetables, yeah. for example? Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a good question. I don't think so. None that I ran across. I think there's varieties that are different, you know, the, um, the ones that, like I was talking about, the Cherokee Trail, the Tears Corn, for example, um, just varieties that were held by families and then almost disappeared. So um, that's, that's all I can think of. Yeah. And I've just gone down a, a pumpkin pie from a, from a an heirloom pump, pumpkin. This organic farmer at the farmer at the St. Paul Farmers Market said it was an heirloom seed, and I didn't pay enough attention to exactly everything he said. But it it, it looked like a dirigible <laughs> in, oh, that, yeah. in that shape, yeah. and it was green, and it turned orange. Oh. But he said that the meat is has much higher protein level, yeah. and and it was denser than pie pumpkins. If anybody cooks pumpkin pie from pie pumpkin, but um, it tasted delicious and it it worked very much the same as the pie pumpkins that I'm used to eating. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Have you gone down to the? Um, John Sherman's sous chef. And yes. do people know about that? Because there's a where you can get yeah. wonderful. Great food. suggestion. So she's mentioning Owamini, which is uh, Sean Sherman's restaurant down on uh, the river. Um, what's that road? The river road? Yeah, it's near the Guthrie. It's, I think yeah, it's, it's the, the old Guthrie. Fuji, yeah. Yeah. And so Sean Sherman is a Lakota chef who is brought back a lot of, well, he's really, he's really created uh, a, a high level of recognition for Native American cuisine. So I uh, really recommend going there. The food is incredible, the story is beautiful, and all of the ingredients are indigenous foods. So if you really want to understand what indigenous foods are, visit his restaurant. It's Owamini, so O W A M N I. Owamini. Yeah, yeah. You can find it online. They um, they've got written up in the New York, you know, best restaurant thing. So it's hard to get reservations right now, but you know, you're flexible. <laughs> you can get in. Oh, 815. One more question or one more question or comment or anybody else have a in the back. How do you protect your seeds from the drip? Oh, yeah. How do you protect seeds from the drip? That's the million dollar question. So corn is is uh, with corn is wind pollinated. So pollen can travel up to 3 miles. And as you know, <clears throat> in Minnesota, we have a lot of corn. So if you're going to grow seeds that you don't want cross-pollinated, then you, um, you have a couple choices. You can time it where you grow out your corn so it pollinates at a different time than all of the fields around you within three miles. <laughs> Tricky. Um, you, can, you can help that process by putting a wind barrier around you so it, it blocks some of the pollen drift, um, or you can learn to hand pollinate, which means you do the work of the wind, gathering the pollen. You have to cover, you have to cover that, um, the, the ear, and you gather your pollen, and then you hand pollinate and keep that covered. 
So it's very labor intensive, but that's a lot of work that we did at Dream of Wild Health. You can also seed select. So the corn that I grow <coughs> is mostly uh, uh, like a, a red, blue, and cream color. So if a yellow kernel shows up, I know it's, it's, um, it's uh, GMO. So I just pluck it out of there. And um, you know, so I'm lucky that I have corn that is that visible. But it is, it's a, it's a real issue. And here's the, the kicker is that if your corn gets cross-pollinated by a GMO variety, you can be sued for stealing patented material. And man, man, uh, I was gonna say Mangenta. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Monsanto did go after farmers um, to try to, pick, uh, to find out and sue farmers who were either saving their seeds or, or um, had been cross-pollinated. So it's a rigged game out there. Um, yeah, and it's not at our benefit. You know, the, like we were saying, the nutritional value of these foods that have been so um, hybridized for reasons of profit rather than nutrition um, and our, our health, then <clears throat> it's, that's, why, that's one of the reasons why it's so important just to pay attention to who's growing your food, who is, who's the farmer, and then there's, there's a great saying, um, pay your farmer or pay your doctor. You know, you choose. It's that, it's that food is medicine uh, teaching. So uh, I just want to thank all of you tonight for coming out and, and really being part of this wonderful conversation. I want to congratulate the White Bear Center for the Arts on this beautiful new building. And I understand that there will be many local talented artists coming, you know, like Craig Rasmussen, I believe, <laughs> coming in February, so you all want to come back for that show. Um, but I, I, I just want to thank all of you for supporting this book. This, is a, this has been a real passion project for me. Um, it's such an important story um, to make sure that, you know, that we understand not only the importance, but our responsibility to to seeds and and um, you know the the world around us. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.